everyone. I'm going to present to you today on the initial findings of Family for Every Child's study into caring for boys affected by sexual violence. We've conducted this study in partnership with Protect None Consulting Group. I'm going to cover the background of the study and its aims. Uh, then I'm going to share the research questions um, and an overview of the methodology. Then I'm going to get into some of the findings around the drivers of sexual violence affecting boys, families' responses to sexual violence affecting boys, sexual violence and alternative care, and sexual violence affecting boys who lack adult care altogether. Um, and I'll end by sharing the next steps for, stu for the study. I should say that um, these findings are from the very initial first draft, so some of them are a little tentative. Um, but we wanted to share them with you nonetheless because we know this is such an important area that so many people are um, seeking out more information on. So a bit of background to the study. Um, Family for Every Child is a network of civil society organisations who we call our members and um, we're all working together to mobilise knowledge, skills and resources around children's care. The network is led by our members who guide all of our work and this study was proposed by our members in the Philippines, uh, Centre for the Protection and Treatment of Child Sexual Abuse, India, Butterflies, Cambodia, First Step Cambodia, Indonesia, Muhammadiyah, and Voice of Children in Nepal. So the aim of the study, um, are these five members wanted to use this study to gain a better understanding of how social norms around gender influence how we care for boys who are affected by sexual violence. Um, and we also wanted to understand what's already being done by like-minded organisations to ensure, ensure that boys affected by sexual violence grow up in permanent safe and caring families or quality alternative care when needed. And that includes looking at the response that they receive um, after experiencing sexual violence and also prevention efforts before um, sexual violence occurs and we'll talk a little bit more about um, what they'll do with this information at the end. So we had two main research questions um, looking at um, what global regional and country specific knowledge exists on caring for boys affected by sexual violence um, because these members in Asia wanted to learn from other regions, but we also have other members who are interested in this study from, from other, other regions. And then the second question was to look at what good or effective interventions exist for addressing sexual violence affecting boys. And some of the sub-questions around question one included consideration of context, culture and social norms around gender and masculinity, family unity and the role of families and others. So for the methodology, the study comprised a literature review of over 100 documents in English, French, Spanish and Portuguese and 20 semi-structured key informant interviews with um, there were around half of them took place with Family for Every Child members and then around a quarter were with other civil society organisations, including organisations that are members of our RISE Learning Network. Um, on, uh, recovery and reintegration from sexual exploitation and abuse and then the remainder were with INGOs and others such as academics and consultants. Um, the documents were identified through these key informant interviews but also um, through um, Family for Every Child members and searches of websites and resource databases such as the RISE Learning Network that I've just mentioned, um, Save the Children's Resource Centre, UNICEF Innocenti, the Better Care Network, um, the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, Oak Foundation, ECPAT, Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Network, Population Council and others. Um, we use search terms uh, to ensure a focus on boys rather than girls or adult men and priority was given to literature and evidence gathered in developing country or lower middle income country contexts. Um, and we didn't, for this initial study, we couldn't do a systematic search of academic databases, but where academic uh, articles were suggested by key informants or identified through other searches, uh, we included them. Um, 
Okay, so let's move on to looking at some of the findings. So, um, first thing we wanted to look at was um, whether there were any um, commonalities uh, in the literature and in the interviews around drivers of sexual violence affecting boys, um, or just whether uh, individual uh, descriptions of drivers help us to understand the issue in more detail. So one thing that came up quite a lot was household poverty um, as a driver of boys' ex uh, engagement in sexual exploitation. And um, what was interesting was that some families are aware of the situation and that some boys and their parents don't perceive the situation to be abusive. Um, also, in some contexts, perpetrators are female, and this is often perceived to be a positive part of transition to manhood which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Also absence of parents uh, while working or when one parent has left or is deceased can leave uh, boys at risk of sexual abuse uh, from outside the home um, and leave space for harmful sexual behaviour to take place. Um, I should say uh, a little bit about the terminology used for this study. Uh, when I say harmful sexual behaviour, um, we chose this term, um, the five uh, members who uh, proposed the study um, and Family for Every Child Secretariat, with the understanding that the study would enable a stronger understanding of the, the scope of appropriate terms that could be used to describe uh, this issue. Um, some people refer to harmful sexual behaviour instead as problematic sexual behaviour, or some just simply talk about um, child offenders of sexual abuse. Uh, but we wanted to um, take a term that's perhaps a lot less um, stigmatising and can, uh, can encompass a full range of uh, behaviours, uh, some of which might not constitute a sexual offence, um, and also understand um, that children aren't always, are, are often not um, culpable um, for that kind of behaviour, and it's often a manifestation of the experiences that they've had and the lack of care that they've had. So we'll, we'll use this term harmful sexual behaviour a bit more throughout the presentation. So yes, um, uh, absence of parents can also force older children, often boys, to take on responsibility for the household economy, which can lead to them engaging in sexual exploitation or leaving the family home to migrate for, for other forms of work that can leave them vulnerable to sexual abuse and sexual exploitation. So abuse and neglect by parents and other caregivers towards children can lead them to leave home which, um, as I've just said, exposes them to risks of sexual violence. Some studies explored the link between poor attachments and uh, between children and parents and harmful, um, and, and children seeking out contact with other adults uh, to, to sort of fulfill this gap in their, in their care um, and support, which can lead to them being sexually abused. Um, the link between harmful sexual behaviour and poor attachments was also discussed, but the findings were mixed. But the study found that a lack of connection between parents and children was a, was a significant factor in many families, particularly when it came to sexuality. So in some contexts, boys left home to avoid uh, stigma and rejection in the community and within their own families as a result of their sexuality. Um, some then sought out support groups online uh, or um, gay communities in other parts of the country, which left them at risk of sexual abuse and exposed to sexual exploitation in some cases. Risky home environments also came up a lot, uh, such as growing up with parents who involved themselves in uh, commercial sexual exploitation um, or um, where boys are exposed to pornography by parents, either um, by accident or on purpose, um, as pornography often has misogynistic scripts um, that can influence boys' own sexual behaviour to be harmful. 
several studies provided accounts of um, the witnessing of domestic violence between parents informing boys' beliefs that violence is justifiable within loving relationships. Um, but we shouldn't consider this as a cause and effect relationship, um, more a complex um, set of um, dynamics to be considered. Substance abuse by parents was widely identified as a key driver of sexual violence against boys within the home. And some suggest that alcohol abuse by boys themselves can co contribute to uh, harmful sexual behaviour. So all quite uh, nascent findings here, um, just things for us to consider um, when working on these issues in our own contexts. The final uh, point is around parental lack of awareness of information technology, which can uh, result in them failing to monitor um, what their children do online. Um, so in some contexts, boys reportedly use um, explicit photographs that they've taken of girls to blackmail them into submitting to harmful sexual behaviour. And that was across um, several different regions. There were examples of countries where this has taken place. But also, um, as we said before, um, boys getting into uh, support groups online where they're then actually in touch with abusers rather than people there to support them and peers um, and parents not monitoring this. Also, lack of communication and information about sex and sexuality between boys and their parents or caregivers was identified as a risk factor um, for both sexual abuse and harmful sexual behaviour. Um, so, and then social norms around um, masculinity uh, often deter their, their fathers from talking to their sons about these issues. So that's really something that can be addressed. And then uh, parents' perceptions that boys are invulnerable to sexual abuse um, also put them at a greater risk uh, of, of being um, sexually abused because parents leave them in situations um, that are risky when they wouldn't for, for girls, uh, such as being able to go out late at night, after dark, etc, go further from home. Um, but uh, such perceptions also lead to tougher approaches to parenting boys, which can be negative for their well-being and lead to negative behaviour, such as harmful sexual behaviour. Um, it can also lead parents to not believe that their sons have been sexually abused um, when they do disclose, which we'll talk about um, in this next section. So the findings around family responses to sexual violence affecting boys. So um, social norms around gender. And the biased focus of service providers and policy makers can lead to the sexual abuse of boys going largely unreported. Studies we reviewed for this, this um, research indicated that in most cases, sexual abuse within the family home targets male and female siblings together, which indicates that identification of sexual abuse affecting girls within the family home fails to identify boys also affected because you know the numbers of, of boys um, uh, affected by sexual abuse around the world are, are usually said to be so much lower than girls but if this is the case that they're targeted often together then um, we might be missing something on a, on a larger scale here. As with girls uh, boys with a disability seem to be at heightened risk of sexual uh, violence overall. Um, sexual abuse of boys is also often not considered to be abusive in the same way that it is for a girl um, so early sexual initiation of boys is often considered to be a sign of manly success or, um, you know, fast tracking a rite of passage uh, that's very positive. Parents often don't understand how a boy can be sexually abused as he should be able to protect himself. And they often don't believe that such an experience could cause long term harm due to perceptions of boys strength and, and um, cultural expo expectations that boys should be emotionally reliant, self-reliant. Um, 
So where boys have been abused by a woman, parents might downplay the situation, instead applauding the boy for his sexual prowess. In some contexts, such perceptions lead parents to knowingly engage their sons in sexually exploitative activities, as they don't think that they're going to be harmful to them and, and could indeed be positive. But despite all these challenges, some parents do respond appropriately when their son discloses that he's been sexually abused. And we noted some examples of parents really lobbying hard for boys to receive the, the support that they need. But sometimes when they do uh, try to uh, get the support, the child protection system is then affected by similar um, barriers, harmful social norms as those described above. And boys and their families might be disbelieved or dismissed um, by both informal and formal parts of the system. And in some cases, the, the lack of response can tip over into inappropriate response with boys reporting sexual violence being removed from their families or even detained um, and sometimes alongside adults where they're at risk of further harm. In contexts where homosexuality is illegal or taboo, parents may respond to their son's disclosure with fear of potential repercussions and shame rather than trying to help him. In these and other contexts, parents be often believe that boys have been responsible for the situation rather than being victims of abuse. And boys may experience stigma and rejection by their family and community after disclosing abuse uh, because they're perceived to be homosexual. Um, and then harmful sexual behaviour. This is, um, it seems to be most commonly displayed by boys. Um, and whether boys or girls, children with intellectual disabilities are also at risk, which may be related to the lack of sexual sex education that they often receive because they're not perceived to be um, reaching sexual maturity um, or uh, yeah sex wouldn't be something that they would naturally engage with so they just simply miss out on sex education also limitations to their interpersonal and self-regulation skills can um, play a role here and also sexual rejection by peers um, can play a role a number of studies explore the link between experiencing sexual abuse and going on to display harmful sexual behaviour towards others, with most emphasising that there is a clear link. But others interviewed for the study noted that harmful sexual behaviour is more often a result of prior physical abuse than prior sexual abuse. Um, so to understand harmful sexual behaviour, instead of focusing on early sexual victimization it's important to focus on the different ways boys and girls deal with or are supported to deal with trauma with girls often internalizing and boys often externalizing with this in mind sexual abuse is an influence rather than a predictor of harmful sexual behavior in terms of parents responses they may downplay harmful sexual behavior rather than responding to it or they may justify it as harmful, harmless experimentation because sexual activity of boys, as we've discussed, is often seen as a positive thing despite their age. But they may also respond with disbelief, shock, confusion, or even fear, particularly if the boy is associated with a gang that's perpetrating sexual violence. So there's two other sets of findings. Um, on sexual violence and alternative care, we looked at three areas. Sexual abuse and physical abuse is common in poor quality residential care, as a number of other studies show, particularly that which is institutional in nature. It affects girls and boys, but boys can be more at risk, particularly in contexts where children in need of care and protection and juvenile offenders whose behaviour may be more harmful towards others uh, reside together. So those in need of care and protection are put at risk by juvenile offenders. The study identified examples of uh, boys being co-opted by staff to punish other children physically as codes of conduct prevent the staff from doing so. This creates a power dynamic that enables sexual violence to occur. Age and development therefore impact on boys' vulnerability to sexual abuse in such settings, and girls by default are at risk as a result of their lesser physical power. 
staff may fail to intervene when harmful sexual behaviour between children uh, takes place, particularly when between boys. They may focus their attentions on trying to influence boys' activity through the promotion of conservative viewpoints, rather than helping them to recover where the activity was harmful or understand their sexuality where it was not. On foster care, we found that rates of sexual violence against children in foster care are higher than for children in the general population. Some studies indicate that girls are more vulnerable than boys, while others indicate that disability is a greater risk factor than gender. Better standards of recruitment and screening of foster parents and better information sharing between professionals have been recommended to address sexual abuse in foster care. In the majority of cases, kinship care can provide a positive alternative where parental care is not possible or in a child's best interests, and children can be well cared for in these arrangements. However, there are instances where they're left vulnerable to sexual abuse. A study in the Philippines identified greater risks of sexual assault for boys left with kin by migrating parents than for girls. So the findings on sexual violence affecting children living outside of any adult care. Children are separated from their families, but outside of formal or informal alternative care arrangements um, can be in a number of different situations that leave them without adult care and at risk of sexual abuse. The vulnerability of boys to recruitment and use of armed, by armed forces and armed groups for sexual purposes has been outlined in international frameworks. However, a recent study argues that gender stereotypes that assume boys are less vulnerable persist, and this leads to limited support being given to them. Even if they're not recruited for sexual purposes, boys are more likely to be recruited into armed forces and armed groups than girls, and they're also more at risk of recruitment as they're more likely to migrate alone. Boys associated with armed forces and armed groups can also be forced into harmful sexual behaviour towards others as a method of induction and control. In detention, boys associated with armed forces and armed groups can be subject to torture, which involves sexual violence. Refugee and migrant children are exposed to risk of sexual violence, including survival sex, while accompanied. Adolescent boys are often hard to place in alternative care and end up languishing in crowded transit centres alongside adults where they risk sexual abuse. And lack of services and community support heightens their vulnerability further. Contact with families, however, can be a protective factor. So uh, using um, messaging services, keeping contact over the phone, etc. Key informants noted that boys who migrate alone are at risk of sexual violence while engaged in exploitative work, particularly work that causes them to stay overnight in their place of work or in their employer's residences. And in many societies, migration constitutes a rite of passage to becoming a successful adult male. And boys demonstrate social competence by migrating. Where homosexuality is taboo, boys who identify themselves as gay might migrate to urban centres where it's more accepted. Boys are more likely to be living on the street than girls and, in, and studies in several regions show that they're at high risk of sexual exploitation and abuse by peers, gangs, tourists, locals and police. Studies in se several regions reported sexual violence taking place among boys living on the street as a way of certain control over others. In some instances it's tolerated in exchange for protection from sexual violence from others. In other instances, these dynamics leave children vulnerable to sexual exploitation, as those in a position of dominance become pimps or engaged in grooming younger children on behalf of pimps. Such behaviour might not be recognised as abusive by the children concerned, and initiation to gangs can require children to harm others sexually in a similar way to armed forces and armed groups, as earlier discussed. As with many of these issues, the dominant focus are of sexual exploitation um, interventions, interventions is on girls, but studies show that boys are also victims. In some contexts in different regions, boys are specifically targeted, including by tourists, businesswomen, 
in dance troops and as sexual slaves, often as part of long-standing cultural practices that are generally accepted. Studies suggest that prior experience of sexual abuse in the home increases the likelihood of boys being sexually exploited on the street. Despite some of these boys um, leaving home because of the sexual abuse, they then uh, are subjected to further abuse later on. In one study, rates of sexual exploitation were greater for children who'd migrated than for children engaged in hazardous labour who'd stayed at home, particularly because they'd migrated specifically, sorry, potentially because they had migrated specifically to earn money and as, as a result would resort to more drastic measures to do so. That was the hypothesis of the, of the researchers. In terms of child marriage, boys are married early in some uh, places, although they comprise only 18% of all children who marry under the age of 18 globally. Studies suggest that marriage of adolescent boys can be related to constructions of masculinity, as in order to be considered men, these boys have to take on the responsibility of marriage and work. So what are the next steps for the study? As I've mentioned, the, uh, these findings are the very initial first draft findings. So, you know, you might have uh, seen that there's not, um, there's some work that needs to be done around um, clarity of certain points and um, yeah, some of the, some of the flow um, we're looking at as well. Um, but we do hope to be able to share um, these findings externally once we've gone through a further round of, of reviews internally. Um, so we're going to be sharing um, the draft with our own members at our annual assembly of members in October and um, then there'll be a second draft uh, where we'll, we'll look for some input from interested key informants that participated in the study and then we'll be finalising the paper. So we hope that using the findings of this scoping study, um, the members that proposed it, those five members in Asia, will be able to conduct primary research in their countries and then implement and evaluate projects that draw upon the scoping study and these primary research findings. Um, so uh, we hope to disseminate the findings of these pilot projects uh, to help us advocate for wider change on, on this issue. Um, so this is a project that we're seeking funding for and we hope to be able to implement quite soon. So thanks very much for listening and I believe we'll, we'll have an online uh, Q&A session uh, later on in this conference where I can respond to questions you might have. Thanks very much. Bye bye.